Good day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at Adaptive for our latest product feature series webinar. Um, if some of you have attended these in the past, uh, we've held these over the last couple months. Um, we feature different modules in our software solution that uses 3D printing to create bolus, boluses or brachytherapy applicators for use in radiation therapy. So today we're going to talk about the latest innovations in our HDR high dose rate surface brachytherapy module. Uh, so um, again, those for those of you who have attended some of our past webinars, we go through a little refresher on adaptive and some of the features and advantages of our software solution, as well as some of the use cases on what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I'll run through this quickly. Uh, most of you have probably seen this. I know you're avid listeners and attendees of our webinars, so uh, I won't spend too much time here, and we can always talk about this after in a separate one-on-one -on -one meeting with you at any time. So we, we offer an advanced 3D printing software solution uh, from Adaptive, our 3D bolus software uh, that is used for treatment in photon electron uh, radiation therapy as well as high dose rate surface brachytherapy. Uh, we use patient specific CT data and RT struct data uh, to create specific customized patient specific medical accessories uh, for use in radiation therapy. Uh, as you all know, personalized healthcare is definitely the way modern healthcare um, is trending and the beauty of our software is that it it uses uh, patient specific data and integrates directly with your clinically commissioned TPS um, to produce uh, boluses or, or 3d printed uh, brachytherapy applicators uh, in terms of regulatory clearance we're the really one-of-a-kind solution in the market uh, last July and in, in July 2018 we received our uh, FDA clearance FDA 510 clearance in the United States we're the first company in the world to receive that designation um, for using our 3D printing software uh, for use in radiation oncology. So we're very proud of that and very um, pleased with the progress we've made as a company. Uh, in Australia and New Zealand, we have uh, approvals, regulatory approvals there. Uh, WAND is the database that we're listed in in New Zealand. As well as in Europe, we have our CE mark um, and also ISO 13485 certification. So uh, from a quality management perspective, we're, we're covered. Uh, the last bullet here on validation and verification is something that we've undertaken uh, ourselves and spent 3,000 plus man hours on validating uh, our 3D printer that we use, um, that we basically promote in conjunction with our software. It's the Axiom 20 that's provided by Airwolf 3D out of California. Uh, now you can use any 3D printer with our software. Again, the beauty of, of software and 3D printing applications is they're very interchangeable. Uh, but we spent a lot of time on the printer as well as materials to use with the printer, so you can always inquire uh, directly with us about that more. Um, just an update on our customers here across the world. So we're now in 11 countries. Uh, we've grown four countries this year um, and actively adding more. So a lot of progress is being made. A lot of momentum is picking up with uh, the use of our solution across the world. Uh, the presenter of our webinar today will get into these in a lot more detail, uh, but just some of the advantages of our solution. I mentioned uh, the seamless and full integration with your clinically commissioned TPS and existing workflows. So not a lot of new things to learn here. It's very easy. We want to make it really easy on the end user. So you'll see when we go through a live demo of our software, how easy it is to use. And, and it'll look very similar to what you use already today. Um, fabrication design are optimized. You know, this, this time savings from using our software are just um, huge. So you'll see that in, in some of the cases we show and, and as um, our presenters takes you through a live demo of our software, um, that's huge. You know, we eliminate the need of using, you know, wax and complex ways to manually iterate layer by layer, slice by slice, creating um, different applicators and bolus structures. So um, really easy to use our software and the benefits are widespread. You know, we reduce and almost eliminate air gaps uh, compared to traditional um, methods such as Superflap or the Freiburg flap, uh, we improve sparing of healthy tissues. Um, we and above all, you know, in the end, our, our main goal, as as everyone across the board has, is improving patient care and comfort and the treatment that patients receive. And you know, we feel that we provide the highest standard of patient care out there with our software solution. So um, you'll see that firsthand as we go through this webinar. You know, again, just some of the uh, the traditional methods of, of brachytherapy, um, you see here the Freiburg flap, as I mentioned, where catheters are mounted close to the skin uh, and um, 
basically uh, a source is imp implemented, uh, a catheter is used to irradiate the area. So uh, these catheters are mounted at uniform distance uh, with uniform spacing between them. Uh, this example here, as you can see, is quite expensive. Uh, it's very time consuming and really difficult to conform to patient anatomy. Uh, so in comparison to our solution, we're really patient specific and easy to use and easy to conform to that patient anatomy. Um, other applications here of the traditional method of, of, soft, of using uh, brachytherapy, um, you know, wax is used a lot. Uh, you know, use a wax mold with plastic catheters mounted within that. Um, some really hard things are difficult to verify the distance between the surface and the spacing between the catheters. Um, and it's also possible manually to create curvatures of the catheters that are too tight and, you know, resulting in an unusable mold. And you have to go back to the drawing board and start at uh, square one. So not the most efficient process. Um, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, you know, it's the only way some some people are able to do this. So, uh, you know, we're really pleased to be able to introduce our software to those. Um, you know, the challenges of using wax um, is even worse in brachytherapy cases compared to boluses because of the added complexity of embedding catheters. So um, we actually have uh, one of our clients, Clatterbridge Cancer Center in the UK, has been using our solution since 2017. And, you know, they had the same challenges they faced beforehand with, with using wax, very difficult of uh, the complexity of adding and embedding the catheters, um, difficult to verify the space and distance between those. And, and then the time, the fabrication time was so time consuming and can only be done by very experienced professionals. Um, so, you know, using our software, as you'll see, it opens up the, the labor pool of uh, many more people in your staff being able to create and fabricate uh, brachytherapy applicators. So you see Cloudbridge was really pleased and happy. You know, um, our solution addressed all the problems they were facing. Uh, they're able to use brachytherapy treatments a lot more. And at the time, it was the only commercially available solution to meet those needs. So a happy customer always goes far in our books. We love, we love to hear that. Um, again, just an overview of our, our, our brachytherapy module and what it does. It overcomes these challenges of time. Um, you know, you're able to use more, more labor and staff to create these, these accessories and applicators. It improves dose uniformity, so uh, dose homogeneity and uh, an optimal balance of dose delivery can be achieved through our software. I uh, mentioned the staff. Uh, you're able to customize these things, as you'll see in the live software demo, how easy it is to position catheters and trajectories of those catheters and, and fix them and very, uh, very affordable. So not only in terms of the materials you're using, but uh, the staff that and the time required by staff is much shorter. So you're really opening up those efficiencies. Uh, just a quick overview of a case. Again, I point out the time, uh, you know, our software in the left, our applicator created through our software took a couple minutes to really um, optimize and design that those catheter tunnels and distances uh, on the on the right here you've taken two full days to manually slice by slice layer by layer um, fabricate the device and the applicator uh, again we use patient specific information CT data and RT structs to create a custom fit applicator and uh, you know the complex iterations to the design can be achieved through easy point and click which you'll see uh, through the live software demo in a few minutes uh, compared to the traditional you know, wax layer by layer at the time and, and manual iterations are just uh, not the most ideal way to do these things. So without further ado, I'll introduce our presenter today. His name is Borko Vesaric. He's a uh, medical physics specialist here at Adaptive and I won't steal too much of his thunder so I'll hand the screen over to him now. Thanks, uh, thanks for being. So, um, hello everybody. Um, my name is Borko Basaric uh, and I'm a medical physics specialist uh, here at Adaptive. Um, I'm also a product owner of the 3D Bulls uh, software, which uh, essentially means that I gather the product requirements and user needs and uh, I cooperate with our development team uh, in re research and development of all of our new, bull, uh, new modules in, in our 3D Bulls software. 
uh, and basically, um, ultimately, I would have to clinically QA anything that comes out uh, as a, as a as a module, as a new module from from our company, uh, and which is um, ultimately embedded in, the, in our three D Pulse software. Um, I have ten years of experience in radiation therapy, medical physics, um, in clinic, uh, and this is the second year um, I've been working for uh, adaptive now. So um, let's uh, jump to the um, some of the specifics of the uh, 3D Bolus software and in particular the uh, service brachytherapy module. Basically the main goals uh, are to um, reduce a constant standoff distance of the uh, source trajectory and constant separation distance. Uh, so these distances um, we want to be user defined. So um, in respect to some of the traditional methods that are out there um, uh, where, where certain kind of applicators are, are being sold, which have generic standoff and separation distances, uh, with our um, software, uh, we want to um, give users a chance to, uh, to actually choose uh, and define their own uh, standoff and separation, uh, because ultimately in their plans or pre-plans, um, some other uh, uh, some other standoff and separation distances may um, so other than the generic ones of one centimeter separation, five millimeter standoff can produce much better uh, clinical plans. Um, we want to uh, allow users uh, a customizable orientation of, of source trajectories and also to allow users to customize a radius of uh, catheter tunnels. Um, also, one of the features that is, um, I would say, unique for our software is that we can flag uh, the minimum radius of the curvature uh, of the trajectory and we can manually fix it. And ultimately, we want to minimize all the uncertainties involving uh, spatial fidelity uh, in the design as well as in the um, 3D uh, printing uh, itself. So uh, let's just uh, briefly begin with the um, uh, showing how the interface uh, of our module um, looks like. Uh, so basically here uh, you see um, a 3D view where you can see uh, an applicator which is to be um, modified. Uh, um, for uh, service bracket therapy, and on the right, uh, from top down, you can see uh, all the uh, all the features and the options uh, you can choose in order to um, uh, ultimately define and design uh, your uh, service uh, bracket therapy applicator. So. The first thing uh, you would need to uh, operate our software are DICOM CT images and DICOM RT structures uh, of your patient uh, or any kind of uh, data set. Uh, and from the RT structures, you would need a body contour uh, and applicator uh, contour. Uh, upon uh, importing uh, these uh, DICOM files into our software, you can actually choose the orientation uh, number uh, of source trajectories as well uh, as standoff uh, and separation distances um, and as well uh, you can choose um, tunnel uh, radius. So this is very important uh, choosing the tunnel radius because ultimately you will, you will be using a certain type of catheters, uh, most usually six French but doesn't have to be. Uh, you will be using a certain uh, a material for 3D printing so all these, uh, all these features uh, are actually pinpoint to uh, to what kind of uh, orientation number, sign of separation, and time radius uh, you will be ultimately uh, commissioning for, for use uh, in your own uh, clinic. Uh, let's talk briefly um, about the algorithm uh, itself. So if a user wants to choose uh, orientation of trajectory uh, to be aligned with this um, yellow line here on the left image, uh, our uh, software essentially um, uh, creates, um, although behind the scenes, it creates a set of contours which are kind of um, uh, lie in planes we have, which have uh, a constant uh, interplane distance. Uh, the goal uh, of these contours is that they will be um, 
pushed down into the applicator and uh, this um, uh, with this we can create a constant uh, standoff so uh, just to note these uh, contours are are virtual uh, for the moment uh, um, the second stage introduces a cut plane a cut plane is important because uh, left and right from the cut plane a set of points will be um, designed uh, along these virtual contours from the stage one and these um, uh, these points will be separated by a constant uh, separation distance or constant intertrajectory distance so uh, uh, finally we would get a, a set of points which are equally spaced uh, and which have a, a, a constant standoff from the body side uh, of the applicator uh, which will ultimately form uh, our uh, catheter uh, tunnels to be used. Um, the third stage is actually uh, upon generating our um, uh, trajectories is that we can see uh, uh, each one of the trajectories and we can see uh, if there are any flagged parts of the tra trajectory here uh, they are uh, shown in red uh, which basically pose a safety uh, a threat to um, a, a source to be potentially stuck uh, so um, these parts uh, actually flag uh, the, um, uh, the part of the trajectory which has a radius of curvature um, less than a certain threshold that is set by a user. So usually uh, in literature, this uh, threshold is found to be around 13 uh, millimeters. So um, if you want to go uh, more stringent about the minimum radius of curvature, uh, uh, you would set this uh, threshold to 14, 15, 16, so more than 13. And uh, upon setting that in our uh, advanced settings, um, uh, and upon calculating the trajectory uh, of our user-defined trajectory uh, within the applicator, uh, algorithm will find all the parts of the trajectory that have radius of curvature uh, less than the minimum value that has been set uh, by uh, a user. Um, the end result of our algorithm is essentially a 3D rendered object, um, which you can, you can see here in our uh, 3D view. But what we actually need uh, is not a 3D rendered object. We actually need um, something else uh, which we'll use back in the TPS. And those are RT structures, or particularly RT structure of the modified um, applicator. So here we see um, uh, RT structure of the applicator that has been already designed uh, in our software and we can, so the most important thing here is that we can actually export um, RT struct, the modified RT struct back into your Brachy TPS or for any kind of uh, QA, uh, pre-plan, plan, so whatever you need uh, for whatever you need, you can actually export uh, the modified RT struct uh, back uh, into the TPS. Uh, the other type of file that you will essentially need is the STL file. So STL file is the file of the 3D rendered object that is uh, ultimately compatible with the 3D printers. So the STL file will um, ultimately be used for uh, actual 3D printing uh, the device. Um, here are just some pictures of how uh, um, 3D printed surface brachytherapy uh, applicator actually looks like. So this is just um, uh, this is just a sample um, of, of sculpt. Um, and um, basically, um, I, here I, I want to talk about some of the results uh, of the QA tests we, we, um, uh, we've been researching in the meantime. So um, with some of the QA tests, we verify the accuracy and consistency in standoff and separation distances. Uh, of our applicators and we um, came to a conclusion uh, through our research that this uh, accuracy and consistency uh, is within uh, half of a millimeter. Um, uh, and also experimentally we found that a catheter tunnel diameter of 3.2 millimeters uh, was uh, appropriate for six French uh, catheters. So uh, if the six French catheters uh, diameter is two millimeters, we found that 3.2 millimeters, so just slightly larger, 
uh, tunnel uh, radius uh, or sorry tunnel diameter will accommodate the, the six French catheter and all that by using a minimum uh, radius of curvature of 13 millimeters so we uh, chose our threshold uh, minimum threshold to be 30 millimeters but uh, ultimately um, all of these features like um, uh, diameter of the tunnel, uh, the uh, minimum radius of curvature of trajectory uh, can be uh, set by user and defined by users. And ultimately, users can commission themselves what would be uh, the tunnel diameter appropriate for type of catheters they are clinically using. Uh, so also, uh, we can manually uh, fix this minimum radius uh, of uh, trajectory curvature and uh, by fixing the nodes, uh, I, will, I will show that to you, uh, I will show that in a minute uh, within our software, uh, but when um, actually uh, uh, modifying the nodes within plus or minus one millimeter, we can actually fix uh, the minimum radius of trajectory uh, of, of um, uh, trajectories, uh, curvatures. Uh, and ultimately, um, uh, about spatial fidelity, we want to um, bring all the uncertainties down to, uh, to acceptable levels, which involve 3D printing. Uh, and um, ultimately, our device will be 3D printed, and any uncertainty uh, in spatial fidelity will depend on the nozzle size, uh, layer height, uh, the type of material, and ultimately, um, printer. Uh, or other printer settings. Uh, the beauty of it is that all these uh, parameters can be uh, defined by users and can be commissioned to accommodate um, all the user needs. Okay, let's talk about some of the conclusions. Um, the um, biggest added value for uh, our module is actually its versatility. So um, a user can select uh, the orientation, the standoff, uh, and separation distances of trajectories, uh, the tunnel radius, and the minimum radius of trajectory uh, of curvature. Um, the thing is that uh, by using and by selecting all these um, settings, uh, users themselves can actually uh, commission the, their surface practicality device. Uh, also, uh, I would uh, want to mention something about the risk mitigation. Uh, that our software is the only software that can actually pinpoint the part of the trajectory of uh, BRAC therapy source um, curvature that basically uh, is um, has radius uh, or less than a certain threshold. And this is very important because um, if the um, radius of trajectory uh, is less than a certain threshold, there is potential risk of uh, radiation source uh, being stuck uh, uh, in the tunnel. Uh, so uh, we can mitigate any risk by flagging all the parts of the trajectories that pose uh, that risk. Um, also, uh, uh, our software is pretty easy, uh, easy to use. Uh, it requires a short training, but ultimately it's designed for medical physicists, bathymetrists, and RTTs uh, uh, to handle it. And basically, uh, for, for times needed to produce uh, or for times needed to design uh, a device, uh, as Rokit said, uh, it requires uh, one minute or two minutes uh, of software time to design uh, the actual device. Um, the costs uh, long term uh, are, are very small compared to tr traditional methods and traditional applicators and also um, the staff needed to design and ultimately fabricate uh, the uh, 3D printed applicators are reduced to let's say one person or maybe two if one is designing and the other is, is um, a dedicated uh, person for a 3D printer. So, but that, that can be done uh, just by one person uh, in respect to uh, like traditional methods where you need the whole team to actually design and, and, and fabricate uh, the device. Um, um, ultimately, the um, uh, producing the 3D printed um, surface bracket therapy applicator actually involves the art of 3D printing, right? So, um, uh, 
Uh, as I mentioned uh, on many occasions, uh, 3D printing is a fairly new technology and uh, I usually compare it to uh, driving a car. So uh, before 3D printing, we actually have to learn how to 3D print. We have to learn how to drive the car and uh, uh, driving a car, it's, it's not a, a big deal. So uh, 3D printing should not be a big deal, but uh, I always say that uh, um, there has to be a person in the hospital who is dedicated to um, learning how to 3D print and um, that uh, use of 3D printer should be uh, just fine if you have a dedicated person uh, for that. Um, ultimately, our next steps in, uh, in um, designing uh, and developing the, our module would be to automatically fix uh, the curvatures and trajectories that have radius smaller than the set threshold uh, value and we want, uh, we want to be able to um, basically automatically uh, fix those. Um, before we jump to uh, uh, demoing the software, here are some of the references uh, that you can use uh, and you can read. Um, and now I would, uh, I would um, like to go to, to demo uh, the software for you. Um, so as you can see, uh, this is the landing page uh, of our software and as you can see we have three modules uh, available at the moment. But we will jump right into our uh, service bracket therapy module. Uh, as I said, uh, the, uh, the files that you actually need to start uh, designing in our software uh, is, uh, are basically um, Dicom RT structures and um, Dicom uh, CD images. So I'm just importing those. Um, uh, as you can see here, we can see CD. Uh, imported CD DICOM images. You can see um, DICOM RT structs the contour in green and the applicator um, contour uh, in blue. I must say that um, a lot of people ask me how do they create this applicator. So this applicator is just generically uh, created in the TPS uh, as um, a bowl structure or just just um, uh, and drawn or however you can actually uh, um, uh, design uh, uh, just a generic uh, uh, applicator. Uh, but um, the most important thing is that your applicator needs to um, needs to follow the contour uh, of the body, which is uh, very important because uh, every device that we produce is ultimately a patient-specific device. Um, so uh, the contours must be uh, just right uh, and um, for the body contour and for the applicator. So um, uh, as I said, software is uh, very easy to use. Um, you work from top down. Uh, first, you would browse your uh, um, a data set uh, and import your data set, sitting back on images and other structs. Then you would choose your body structure. Uh, you would choose your applicator structure, which in our case is um, nose. And uh, in this stage, we would go into a 3D uh, view where the user will um, choose the orientation of tunnels. Let's say we'll go with sagittal. Uh, of course, we have three, um, I would say, primary uh, prime directions, um, axial, sagittal, and coronal. Uh, but as uh, we, we can uh, choose any kind of oblique um, uh, trajectories as well. Not, not that we need in this case, but the software is versatile enough to allow that and for some of the more complex geometries like sculpt, for instance, uh, this feature uh, uh, can be used and it's very handy to um, actually place the, the, the uh, orientation of trajectories. Um, in the settings, you can see the intertrajectory distance, which is basically the separation distance, which you can um, choose uh, however you like or however it suits your uh, clinical plan. Uh, also, the number of trajectories you can add or, or you can subtract. Um, uh, surface distance, which is uh, the standoff, which can be changed. Uh, let's just keep it uh, with five millimeters at the moment. And here you can commission your tunnel radius. Well, let's just 
foot 1.6 because ultimately we found that the uh, this thumb radius works with the PLA material and 13 millimeter minimum radius of um, trajectory uh, curvature trajectory. Um, let's generate some trajectories. We can see here some red parts. Um, let's just um, go to the tra trajectory and let's just try to grab some of these nodes and fix the trajectory. As you can see down on the left side, you can see by how much you're moving uh, the standard distance of each node. And ultimately, you can uh, set these trajectories um, to be free of any risk of, of, of source potentially being stuck. Uh, when we try to subtract, so all these trajectories will be subtracted uh, with the tunnel radius of 1.6 millimeters and we'll get our um, tunnels. So as I said, this is a 3D rendered object. And um, ultimately, if we go to post-processing, we will see the RT structures that are generated, uh, which can be now exported back to the TPS. And also, uh, we can see uh, the export uh, of the STL file, uh, which is ultimately um, used for 3D uh, printing uh, itself. Um, also, we have some uh, additional post-processing features, which are cleaning and the symmetry. Uh, so the symmetry is most usually, um, it, it's used basically, uh, well, maybe not with brachytherapy, but certainly with um, standard boluses, uh, uniform thickness boluses, where we actually uh, design a custom uh, pocket for a dissimeter, for, uh, for example, a nanodot or something similar. Uh, and cleaving, we use to cleave the bolus structure or the applicator structure into halves. Uh, so, for example, if the uh, print uh, is too large for your build volume of your 3D printer, you can easily uh, cleave the bolus uh, in half and print the two halves um, on a printer. So, uh, as I said, ultimately, uh, you will be uh, getting a 3D render of the uh, applicator. It can be exported as an truck, it can be exported as the STL. Uh, here uh, we have some uh, interesting post-processing features uh, like a patient label. So we can actually put a patient label in fine print um, on the applicator. Uh, we can use the uh, cropping tool. Um, cropping tool is very important for 3D printing because the lower part of print or the part of the print that will be ultimately facing the printer bed must be completely flat. So uh, if we just take, I would say, just one, one millimeter of the applicator and crop it so that we ensure that the, um, uh, the surface uh, is flat, that uh, will be lying uh, on the printer bed. Uh, if we can ensure that, uh, we can ensure that uh, the success uh, of our um, 3D print. And basically, that would be it. All right, thank you so much, Borco. That was an awesome overview uh, for all of our attendees here. I'm just going to take us back to the slideshow and um, we can now open up the floor for some questions. Thanks everyone for uh, for your patience while, and listening through to the webinar, uh, and thanks to Borgo. Um, that was a great overview uh, of of the uh, brachytherapy module. Um, we do have one question here from Manuj. Um, there, the question is, what is the expected cost of a device, and is it covered by insurance? Uh, so this that's a tricky one. Uh, 
there's no good answer, and, and I think the answer right now is, is it depends. Um, it depends where you are in the world uh, and different insurance policies, of course, um, and how much, uh, you know, what type of materials you use to produce a, dev a device or an applicator. Um, so sorry, Manuj, we don't have a great answer for that, um, but it's something that we could definitely talk about uh, offline or individually with anyone who has that same question. Um, in the United States, there are actually um, CPT codes where you can get reimbursed for uh, medical devices, uh, patient-specific, I should say, medical devices. Uh, there's a category uh, under CPT code 77334, I believe, um, which varies state to state in terms of the reimbursement cost. Um, so again, it depends where you are in the states. Um, Elsewhere in the world, you know, different uh, healthcare policies, insurance policies, and healthcare um, standards, you know, uh, in different countries will also depend. So, um, definitely would love to uh, take uh, a more time to hit, talk to you, Manuj, about that. And anyone else who has that question, please um, let us know. Uh, at the end, uh, after this uh, presentation, we'll be sending out a link to this webinar, and you can reply to that email address uh, with any further questions you may have. There's another question here from Johan. Uh, how much time does it take to one impression, like the example that Orca was showing in the software, I, I take that you're referring to, Johan. Um, so yeah, Orca. Oh, um, thanks, Johan, for the question. Uh, so we can divide this question basically in how much time does it take to design the device and how much time does it take to print the device? So uh, as you saw, uh, just a few minutes ago, um, when I demoed the software, uh, I needed a um, couple of minutes uh, with all the explanations um, to actually design the device. Uh, printing the device is something else. So printer needs, for example, for this nose to be printed, it needs, let's say, three to five hours. So, um, and why did I say three to five? Because it ultimately depends on the percentage infill uh, you want to use. And I see here the next question, and it, it, it's very good to build up on this next question, and I will answer why. Um, uh, again, the times can vary, let's say three hours, four hours, five hours, or maybe six hours. So the next question is, uh, is there a specific material that needs to be used? For electrons, we need the tissue equivalent material, but from Bracky, we are only creating distance. Exactly, so that's why we don't need 100 percentage infill. 100 percentage infill uh, of the printed device means that there is no air uh, or air, any kind of air gaps inside uh, the printed uh, device. So that's, that's a good point, point from Manuj that we actually don't need 100 percent infill because we're just creating a distance. So we use less percentage infill for uh, brachytherapy uh, devices, uh, well, let's say 20 to 30 percent, which uh, additionally reduce uh, the printing time. So I would say that uh, a 20 to 30 percent infill of this nose sample that you uh, have just seen uh, in the demo uh, will take, let's say, approximately four hours to print and a couple of minutes to design uh, beforehand. If you, for whatever reason, have a very large print, like a large scalp, or any any kind of large print that needs much more uh, hours to print, then uh, we recommend that print uh, is started um, in the evening, and uh, you know you can leave the print overnight, and when you come to your working place in the morning, the print is over. So there are many. Um, there are many ways how you can mitigate uh, the, the printing time issue, but um, for the most of localizations and for the most of, of, of printed devices, they, those are fairly fairly small and don't, don't require more than like five, six, seven, eight hours, something that can be printed during the day or uh, the worst case scenario, you can uh, you know, start the print in the evening and in the morning, uh, it will be ready uh, for use. Yeah, great answer, Borgo. Um, next question here from David. So what kind of material do you use the most? And 
I'm not sure if Borgo mentioned in, in your last answer there um, about the PLA yes. and using that for 20, 30 percent infill. But yeah, go ahead. Yes, so uh, we use uh, PLA. PLA is polylactic acid, so it's a uh, it's basically a plastic material. Uh, the reason why we use uh, PLA uh, is because um, PLA has well, I'd say that PLA has a perfect spatial fidelity, meaning that what you design in our software is what you will be printing uh, with the very small uncertainties of let's say half of a millimeter um, in xy direction and even less 0.1 millimeter in z direction so th those are really small uncertainties that are connected to um, 3d printing and that's why we use a pla of course you can use some other um, materials some let's say more flexible materials, um, but those materials tend to warp or, or to flex. And the, big, the bigger and the thinner they are, the more they flex, but at the same time, they're flexible enough and they can be taped to a patient. So there, there are some pros and cons, uh, uh, and ultimately it's a clinical decision which kind of, um, material you would use. Some use PLA, some use Cheetah Flex, which is a, a flexible um, plastic material. Um, but um, as I said, it's a clinical decision and it's about the commissioning of these materials and what clinicians uh, find most useful in, in their environments. Yeah, another uh, material that we've validated uh, in addition to PLA is TPU, so thermal yeah. plastic, your polyurethane which is Ninja Flex, Cheetah yeah. by Ninja Flex, um, sim similar to Cheetah Flex. Yeah. So, um, you know, either or uh, can be used. And, and it looks like David has another follow-up question in, in addition to the material. So he's wondering if there's any concern with air, or air gaps in between the applicator um, used in, in HDR Bracky when the infill is, is lower at 20 to 30%. Okay, so um, hello, David. Uh, this is a very good question. So, um, if you would like to have um, backscatter material uh, in your applicator, and that's why we actually suggest that the applicator, the initial applicator designed in the TPS should be two centimeters um, in, uh, uh, in Z direction and two centimeters away from PTV in every direction. So it should be designed like that. Uh, if you wish to have uh, a backscatter material, then um, the applicator should be printed 100%. So um, it, it's also a clinical medical physics clinical question whether you uh, are fine with just using uh, an applicator that has a lower percentage infill because you just want a certain uh, standoff um, uh, of the tunnels from from a PTV, but um, if you are really concerned about having a backscatter material and having air inside the applicator, then we suggest that you print the applicator in 100% infill, which will leave no air gaps um, inside the device. Great, Borco, thanks. Uh, I'm not sure David had, uh, typed in Med 610 here. Um, I'm not sure if, I, I don't know what you mean there, um, <laughs> but uh, if you want to elaborate in the chat, you can, David, and we can answer, we can answer that. Uh, so it looks like we have about 10 more minutes. We were looking to wrap up around four, but if there are no other questions, um, we can end early. Uh, you know, maybe one last one. Um, Oh, David saying Med 610 is another material, so that might be uh, like another rigid material or um, like Inaflex. I, I'm not sure, but yeah. So, so we have we we have not uh, researched about Med Med 610 um, at the moment, so we cannot speak a lot about it. Um, the only materials that we have researched and that we offer are PLA and Cheetahflex at the moment, so we can speak about those. But um, we will definitely look into MED 610 to, to see what is going on there. Yeah. 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 Great. Thanks, David.
Uh, yeah, so I think to wrap up maybe, um, and if anyone has any more questions, please type them in and we can get to them or, or follow up with you after. But what would be the main advantages of using our software along with 3D printing um, in brachytherapy or, or even in electron and photon uh, radiation therapy? Okay, uh, thanks Rocky for, for the question. Uh, I, I will conclude with this answer because I think it's a, it's, it's a, very, um, it's a very important question actually. Um, so I would divide the answer into like a, a high level answer and, and, and more detailed clinical med phys um, type of answer. So the high level answer would be, so what are the advantages? Uh, at the moment, uh, you can um, design something similar to what we are offering, but ultimately you would need to employ um, a couple of people, you would need to use various open source uh, softwares, uh, maybe a developer or two. So uh, basically you would need a lot of resources to um, accomplish the same thing. Uh, another kind of high level answer is that um, depending on the regulations in certain countries, Canada, US, uh, Europe and the rest of the world, um, uh, important thing is that uh, open source softwares are not welcomed everywhere in, in the clinical practice. So that's something that's going to be uh, and that is going to be addressed in, uh, in Canada and, and US for sure. So that's why our um, FDA 510 can, uh, 5K, uh, 5K approval uh, is, is really important and any type of, of research and any, and any type of like um, uh, legal approval uh, and um, standard standardization is welcomed, uh, uh, especially when dealing uh, in the radiation therapy uh, field. So that's a, another like high level answer. I will interject with just um, oh, in yeah, Europe, sure. Europe MDR, uh, I believe it's medical device registry mm -hmm. registration uh, will be implemented in May of 2020. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the open source homegrown solutions that Borco was just referring to uh, will no longer be allowed from our understanding in Europe. Um, we're actively researching that and we're actually going to have probably another webinar or, or multiple info sessions leading up to May 2020 to let you know the impact of that on your facility and treatment and uh, and what you can do and how our software might be able to fit in and uh, solve the problem there. Yeah. So yeah, sorry, we're going to continue okay. with that. It's okay. So, um, and let's just for, for, for a moment go to, to, to a clinical side and medical physics side of things uh, that um, we're offering a software that basically uh, looks like a TPS, but it's not, it's not, essentially it's not a TPS because it, it does not calculate any dose, but um, it feels very familiar with the MedPhys, uh, dosimetrists, RT, RTTs, um, a notion of what a software, uh, a radiation therapy software uh, looks like. So. Um, at the same software, we are offering all of the features, not only for modifying uh, clinically, uh, for, for clinically use, modifying the devices in terms of, of let's say, brachytherapy or modulated electron um, uh, radiation therapy, uh, but we are, we are also um, offering all these post-processing features that you can only find in some other uh, types of softwares for um, actually, you know, gener uh, like 3D rendering and, and generation of, of 3D uh, models. So we are all, um, we are offering all these tools in one package. So David had another follow-up question. It should be a quick answer here. Uh, have we built any applicators to do interstitial brachy and any concern with the sterilization process? So, mm -hmm. um, so uh, thanks David for another question. So um, we, uh, uh, so in our pathway uh, in research and development, we uh, have booked a spot for interstitial uh, as well as intracavitary and intracavitary interstitial. So all these modules are coming up um, very shortly. Uh, so, um, and about the sterilization process for surface brachytherapy, we are not that much concerned about sterilization using the soap or alcohol. Uh, to clean uh, the device uh, is, is, uh, would be enough uh, as 
for deserialization process is concerned. However, uh, going towards intracavitary and interstitial modules and going towards uh, uh, designing devices that should be implanted into patient, uh, those sterilization processes are much more stringent and we should um, be, uh, we will be using class six USB materials for, for intracavitary and um, uh, in those modules, sterilization process and requirements are, 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 as I said, much more stringent and needs to be addressed uh, on a much detailed uh, level. Great. Yeah, thanks, Porco. And there are, um, for each material, each filament material used, there are specific um, cleaning agents and sterilization um, materials that can be used with them. So we do have all that information in our product specifications. So we can, uh, we definitely send that along when anyone's using uh, the TPU or any filament we validate. So yeah, it looks like that's all the questions for today. Uh, again, we'll be sending out a recording of this webinar uh, to everyone um, here today, as well as anyone who's registered. So um, we do thank you for, for taking the time to attend and join us. And if you have any other questions, please reply to that email where the recording will get sent out to. And, and if you have any of uh, your colleagues, peers, or your team that would like a one-on-one -on -one meeting with us or schedule a, a demo for your team, um, please let us know directly and we can set that up. We'd love to, uh, to take you through the, the software in, in a lot more detail and a lot more time where you can ask questions of us and of our product experts. And, and yeah, we can spend a lot more time with you there. So again, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate your time and everyone enjoy the rest of their day or evening. Cheers.